Welcome everyone to our program tonight. My name is Kate Angelo. I am a librarian at the Long Branch Public Library. I'm happy to be moderating our program this evening. The program, How Did We Get Here? as part of our year long series titled Our Story, focusing on black history, culture, and lives. Also in this series, uh, this week we have Singing Our Story, Resistance, Protest, and Affirmation in Black Music. That's with ethnomusicologist, Dr. Birgitta Johnson. That's Thursday at 4 p.m. On Friday, we, the library will take part in the African-American read-in with a video of staff reading stories and poems by African-American authors. Later this month, we'll also be holding a book discussion of The Revisioners by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. You can access the book on the Hoopla app. For our panel discussion this evening, we have with us Laura Bland, born and raised in Long Branch. Laura has been a preschool teacher in town for the past 11 years. She's a graduate from Amherst College with a BA in psychology and women's and gender studies. Laura always knew she wanted to do something positive in the lives of children. After college, she went on to receive her teaching certification through Montclair University. Clayton Simpson um, was born in Jamaica, but raised in Long Branch. Clayton served in the Marines for four years and at the time of his discharge was ranked a sergeant. He's a graduate from the University of Phoenix Phoenix with a BA in business management, and he's currently um, back in school training to be an electrician. Nikisha Marshall was born and raised in Long Branch and attended Brookdale Community College, where she received an associate's degree in accounting. Nikisha has worked at the Long Branch Public Library for the past 16 years and is currently the manager of the Family Services Department. Michael Bland, also from Long Branch, has committed his entire career to public service. Before joining the, the DFER team, Michael served as the campaign manager for Johanna Hayes in her 2018 Connecticut 5th Congressional District, making her the first African-American woman elected in all of New England to Congress. Prior to his time with Representative Hayes, Michael worked as a deputy chief of staff for the majority conference leader in the New Jersey Legislative Assembly and the Deputy District Director for Congresswoman Elizabeth Etsy of New Britain, Connecticut. Most notably, Michael contributed to the incredible success of the Obama for America campaign, where he served as the Northeast Regional Field Director in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, and conducted region-wide plans for voter registration and event organizing for volunteers. So, between the four of them, they've done quite a lot. So I'm just going to toss questions at them and they're gonna answer and we're gonna learn a little bit more about what they have done and how they get there. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, sort of what drew you to your field and slash what's the best thing about your job? Um, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> What drew me to my field? Um, in college right away, I knew I wanted, like I said before, I knew I wanted to work with children and with women and um, particularly with um, underserved populations. That's what my focus was with uh, majoring with women within women's and gender studies. Um, once I graduated, that field is very small and condensed and hard to get into um, working at a Planned Parenthood or working at advocacy jobs. So um, through trial and error of that position, I began um, working in the school district and then and where I realized that everything I wanted to do um, once I, when I was in college and dreamed of helping others and being part of other, the lives of others, I was really um, coming full circle by being a teacher, especially in Long Branch um, within my own community um, with uh, the population that Long Branch serves. So that is really what led me to um, becoming a teacher. Um, and my favorite part of the day, I am blessed to work with preschoolers who are the most fun group of people to work with. They are my coworkers and I love every minute of um, what they have to say and how they act and seeing their personalities develop. So just being around um, children at that age and seeing them blossom is the highlight of my, I love my career. All right, for me, um, actually, I wasn't really particularly uh, supposed to join the Marine Corps. Um, it's kind of uh, happened out of a whim. Uh, I was actually working at a fiber optic company and uh, 
the company started outsourcing jobs like in the, uh, India, Indonesia, Asia for cheaper labor. Um, and this guy that was working with me, uh, he told me that, hey, look, we're the two youngest in the, um, in the company. Uh, it's a fiber optic company. If they let us go, would you want to join the Marine Corps with me in the buddy program? I never thought about joining the military in the first place, but I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, so that time did come where, you know, they let us go at the same time. Um, we went to the recruiter, I think it was in Red Bank. Um, now, when it comes to recruiting, you have to basically pass like a physical test and a mental test, like knowledge. I was able to pass both of those, but he was not. And I was already committed. So I was like, all right, man, see you later. So I joined the Marine Corps. I did my four years. I was deployed to Okinawa, Japan for a year. I traveled the world, went to combat. Worst part about joining the military. But uh, after my four years, I came back and I decided I want to get a degree on um, business management because at some point I would do want to run my own business. So I uh, did my online University of Phoenix, got my BA. Um, and then what drew me to electrician is um, I also wanted to, I think learning a trade is actually very beneficial. I don't think it can ever hurt if you learn a trade. Uh, I want to be an electrician because it's a very good job. Uh, like, you know, the blends, they got the new houses. If anything ever happens, you want to know how to fix that, right? Uh, it's cheaper if you know how to fix your own stuff. So electrician always, always intrigued me because when I did fiber optics, I loved doing the routing and splicing. And that always intrigued me. So I think at this point in my life, I want to move on. I don't want to work for a company anymore. I do want to work for myself at some point. And I think that's what drew me to be in, uh, trying to get my electrician certification and eventually get my license. Great. I have one follow-up question for you, Clayton, from an audience member. How long, he says, did it take you to learn the trade? But if you're still learning, how long do you know, does it generally take to go through the training? Well, this course is for certification. Mine is residential electrician. It's a year long course. It's a ton of reading. It's a ton of research. Um, you got to really be committed. I mean, you can't slack off um, because electrician, that's not one of the jobs that you could just, you know, play around and think that everything's going to be fine, you know? <laughs> Uh, it's electrician is a very dangerous job. So uh, just to get a certification for a residential electrician, it's a one-year program. And after that, uh, you become an apprentice. After that, you become a journeyman. And then you learn from a master electrician. So it could take three to four years to actually get your license. Great, thank you. Nikisha or Mike, do you want to take that question? These were such great answers that I forgot what the question was. Okay. Um, what's the best thing about your job and what drew you to this field? Oh, okay. Uh, the best thing about my job is interacting with the public. I love people. I love helping them. I love helping them find that new thing that maybe they were never interested in. And it's not just about books. Sometimes I'm an ear that a child can talk to. Sometimes someone's just having a bad day and they come in and Miss Nikisha's here and you know it's it's just an experience for them. And I want to provide everyone with that experience each time they come into the building. Um, and what drew me to my this job actually was I was in high school. I had just uh, quit my previous job and I came here every week to get a book because I loved reading. And um, they said, hey, are you looking for a job? And I'm like, yeah, I am. And I've been here ever since. Uh, but, you know, it's a plus, like I love reading. So I work at a place that provides me with those books. And then once I saw that this place could provide me with more than just that, that's what drew me to stay and I thoroughly enjoy what I do. I guess I'll go. Um, you know, I would say what drew me to this profession is, you know, being around my mother, my father, my uncle Dave for, for years um, and, and having the ability to see how politics work, uh, whether it's on like the official side or how it benefits people in advocacy. And so for me, um, I've always, you know, fell in, I guess, fell in a gap or, or felt like somebody had to fill in the hole to speak for a common person, common man. And so I've had the opportunity to run for office. I've had the opportunity to you know, work in federal government uh, alongside members of Congress or run campaigns on lower levels. So, but there was always this, this knack of like, what else can I do more, particularly in uh, low-income communities or in communities of color? 
Um, because I feel like the biggest way to dig yourself out of a hole is, or the person who knows how to get out of that hole is, is the people, the folks that live there. And so, um, as a national director for leaders of color, it is literally um, my dream job. Um, I wrote wrote it down maybe about two years ago um, on a legal pad, about three or four pages. And it was an initiative that I had actually thought for or thought of for African American men because I thought they don't have a voice in the Democratic Party or the Democratic process. I feel like everybody has a home, uh, but African American men are the only time folks think of African American men is when they think of criminal justice reform. And this kind of fell into place with somebody who I viewed as a mentor from afar for years uh, and gave me this opportunity. So it, it was, it's literally eyes open, eyes closed of finding ways uh, to empower communities of color, uh, to build lead, new leaders civically and politically. Um, because again, I think the best way they can, you know, build themselves out of a hole or, or find new avenues of leadership uh, is, is within them. I often say um, in communities of color, they don't need a task force um, or elected officials shouldn't need a task force or a bind to show them how to get out of holes or how to get them out of situations. It's folks who have lived there their entire lives um, that can, uh, can be assets to their own community. They know that there's food deserts. They know that there's inequities in education. They know that there's inequities in criminal justice reform or the local system. So for me, uh, that's what you know drew me to this. And I would say um, what I love most about this work is literally just you know what I just said is having the ability to work with folks across the country. I mean, having the pleasure to meet presidents and members of Congress and senators, but dealing with everyday folks and empowering them to show them that they can be the next Barack Obama or they can be the next person that they actually see in the mirror. Um, because his plan started down with a pen and a piece of paper. And so I'm excited every day to work in different communities across the country to you know, empower folks to take over their communities. And, and uh, the time for, I guess, reconstruction is over. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Um, what has been more valuable in your career, your education or your experience? I'll go with that one. Uh, to me, I think experience. Um, a lot of people are educated and you can say a lot of people are book smart, but not everybody has common sense. Um, if you got experience in the field, uh, hands-on, or you know, you're actually physically touching what you need to do, that experience goes a long way. Education can only teach you with so much but experience will teach you how to actually do your job properly. Um, you know, a lot of people have to go by the book, which is good. Yeah, that's always good. But um, experience, I think experience far outweighs education in, in some aspects. I would have to say that I agree. With that. Yes, no, I definitely agree. Um, right now, I'm currently like, after 11 years of teaching, finally taking my master's course in um, educational leadership. And there, so after I, you know, I've had 11 years and there are some teachers there who only have one year of teaching under their belt. And some of the time, sometimes when we have group discussions, it's, it's definitely different conversations because, you know, there are some experiences I've experienced and I've experienced the good part of it. I've experienced the bad part of it. You know, I've seen the same situation play out several times. So as much as you, you can learn from a textbook and read from case studies, experiencing something not just once, but multiple times gives you different perspectives and um, definitely the patience to handle a situation differently and more effectively depending on who you're talking to. So yes, it's great to have that background knowledge and obviously, um, you know, factual knowledge and scientific method and, and whatnot, but having those people skills and um, reference points in your own life to refer and to have that interpersonal, those interpersonal skills, especially I think with all of our professions, um, definitely, it's, I think, more beneficial, or, yes, more beneficial. <laughs> yeah, I think we all agree here. Um, I almost feel like I didn't have to answer this in a sense. Uh, experience is a great equalizer. I, I, this is what I've, what I've learned and what I'm doing now. I was never taught in a political science class. Um, I was never taught in a psychology class. I was never taught in the English class. In college, I, I learned that this is literally, uh, politics is literally a progressive science. It changes uh, just about every two years. Um, and most recently, it changes every six seconds. So you have to, you learn, you know, you, you talk about the term uh, chewing gum and walking at the same time. It's like chewing gum, walking, juggling, skipping, and, and, and dealing a hill till at the same time. So it's, it's being able to, you know, work with people. I think that is a trait that um, can be learned, but I think that's an innate trait. And, you know, having the ability to um, understand and be empathetic. And I think that's something, I don't know if that's teachable. I think that that's, that's something that's innate in you. 
Um, but it's definitely an experience. I, and I, you know, a, a real brief story. And what made me want to stick to this work, similar to the question I was asked by uh, Thalia, it was um, one time in 2015, I was in Baltimore doing a running campaign down there for, for mayor. And it was the first time I'd actually seen homelessness on a scale um, to where it was, where folks were living under the bridge, it was about 25 degrees. And I knew it was that at that moment that I would never want to do any other any other profession again. And it was a brief moment in my life where I thought, do I want to do politics? Do I want to stay in politics? Do I want to stay in advocacy? Do I want to continue to do this? Fight for folks who may or may not want you to fight for them or fight for causes that um, folks think are prevalent in their communities. And it was at that moment when I saw, you know, somebody that was homeless and I asked that at that time the can, I was like, how do you think they got there? He said, man, it's easy. You can come home from you can come home from war and all your family's going, you never knew. Or, you know, you could lose your job and and you know, you, you can't get into another job. You could, you know, you could lose anything. So for me, it's, I think it's a, I would like to say it, a natural calling to always be empathetic and think of those bigger than yourself. Cause I think that is the, the true role of a public servant. So definitely experience. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question from a, an attendee. And just to note for any other audience members out there who don't know, um, there's a Q and A um, feature. So if you have a question you want me to toss at our panelists, just type it in there. Um, so this one is, were, were there any times when someone discouraged you from working or doing what you're doing now? I'll take this one. I wouldn't say um, I was discouraged from doing the current job that I have, but when I was in um, middle school, actually, uh, there were, I had two decisions two ideas of what I wanted to do for as a career. So I either wanted to be a nurse or I wanted to be a teacher. And um, we were having a meeting with one of our teachers and he called me back and was like, okay, you know, tell me like what it is that you wanna do so we can start taking the right steps that you need to take to get into this career. And he said that, and I told him and he said, oh, I don't think you would be suited for a teacher. He's like, you don't have the personality, I think, to be a teacher. Look at this class. Would you be able to handle them? And I was so crushed that a teacher told me this. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I won't be a teacher. And I never thought of becoming a teacher after that. So I said, okay, now I'm going to go on the path of becoming a nurse. And which didn't happen, of course. Um, but it was just so very discouraging to hear a teacher tell you, oh, I don't think you should do that. Uh, I'll pick, on, pick, on, pick up on that. Um, <clears throat> it's not really discouraging in a job sense, but as I was transitioning out of the military, out of the Marines, um, I had a gunnery sergeant, you know, he's like a high in rank. And I was a sergeant at the time. So, you know, he knew I was transitioning out of the Marine Corps. I never planned on making uh, the Marine Corps a career. I just wanted to do four years as a stepping stone and get out. Um, but it was about six or seven months before I was supposed to get out. And the gunny came up to me. He's like, hey, Simpson, um, would you like to stay in the Marine Corps? I was like, no, nah, gunny. Um, I'm just, it was just supposed to be a stepping stone. It's not a career move. And uh, he pretty much like, hey, man, when you go back to civilian life, it's going to be hard. You won't be able to find a job. You have a hard time getting a good job. You know, the Marine Corps, we take care of you. We give you barracks. We give you chow. Like, I don't want to live in the barracks and get chowed as tasteless, you know? Uh, I want to be able to move out on my own. And his thing was, the way he was trying to discourage me from getting out is that like he said that getting out of the Marine Corps is going to be hard for you to transition back to civilian life because you're so mentally trained as a Marine, it's hard to get back into civilian life. And to me, I'm like, I'm already in civilian life right now. I just got seven more months before I get out of here. Um, but he really wanted me to stay. I guess he really liked me. Um, I was a good sergeant at the time. Um, but a lot of times when you were in the military, especially Marines, higher ups will try to take you, um, your mentality. They try to like make you think that you're not going to do good as a civilian. And they try to discourage you from getting out because they want you to stay in for 20 years. Um, but if you don't want to be in for more than four, you just got to step on out. You know, you just got to take that leap of faith. And yeah, he really tried to keep me in, but, uh, I wasn't having none of that. That's about the only time somebody tried to discourage me from getting out of getting out of a job that I no longer wanted. Um, as far as discouraging, I think right now, especially with um, 
many jobs and just social media culture in general, everything's just like a negative spin to it. Uh, or the, oh, why are you doing this? Um, and I think teachers, especially right now, there's so many, everything, you know, so many pages like, oh, look, can't believe what this happened. Can't believe this happened. Can't believe this happened. How I could never stay in this. So I quit because of this, so-and-so happened. So there is a lot of negativity, I think, right now around teaching. And it's really, um, for me personally, like I find I can read and, you know, laugh at it. But it's really about isolating my own experiences and not comparing them to anyone else's. Because I'm sure, trust me, if I was in a uh, a completely different town with a completely different circumstances, I might be writing the same thing. So I would never judge anyone for how they feel about the situation or saying like, why are you becoming a teacher? You know, you don't get paid anything. You don't, the list goes on. But uh, um, it's really about sometimes um, when hearing those type of things or when reading those type of memes and things like that, just for me reflecting on why I do it and then like finding that moment of joy within the day that keeps me going. Um, I mean, there are hard days, there are hard weeks, there are frustrating times, but that is any single profession. My children, I love them to death. They're frustrating. But um, so, but you find the joy in having your own children. You find the joy in the little things. So um, I think the culture of teaching is, de is generally discouraging right now. But for me, it's just finding the moments and I'm maintaining my own center of peace, my own purpose and what I'm doing to keep me going. I don't know if I've ever been discouraged, or maybe I have. I mean, because you know, the culture, you know, as a poli sci major, you're, you're going to do two things, right? Or three, you're going to be a teacher, or you're going to be a lawyer, or maybe a politician. Um, and so, none of those quite fell on the track. And so, I, I think one of the things that it was in the culture, more or less as a political operative, it's like, you know, you're on for eight months and then you're off for three months, you're on for eight months you're on for, you know, four months. And so a lot of people say, hey, you know, you got to get something steady, you got to, and I think what more or less what, what I what I would say, I don't know if I've been discouraged, but I have been encouraged to find other avenues in the sector. But to me, it's like what you're passionate about and what you wake up and what sets your hair on fire and what, what you, you know, what makes you understand your why, I think is why I do this. Um, because again, you, you say to yourself, just like everybody here, it's like, if I'm not doing this, then who's doing it, right? If I'm not going to be a voice or if I'm not going to be an advocate, if I'm not stepping in these shoes, um, then who is going to do it? And, and to, but, but to that point, I think Keisha, you would have made a great teacher. Um, so whoever, whatever teacher said that, please send me an email, send me a text so I can, um, so I can address that offline for you. <laughs> I think you would have been an amazing teacher. Thank you. That's funny. Um, second that. Um, I think we all agree at the library as well. I mean, but that's <laughs> um, okay. Um, how do you handle workplace disappointment? I'll take a shot at that. Um, <laughs> it's very simple. Um, nobody, you have to understand, nobody is going to do what you want them to do the way you want to do it. And you have to be clear on your expectations. And I think that's something I fight fight with their times that, you know, Laura would say, I, I, I'll sit in the office for, you know, eight, nine, 10 o'clock or, you know, say, hey, you know, you could delegate. My team always says, delegate, delegate to somebody else. Um, you, you're going to be disappointed every, you know, there's going to be something every day that's going to be, you know, is going to disappoint you. Uh, but there's a saying that my coach in college told me one time that I, I kind of, it sticks to me as much as I try to let it stick to me is be at your best regardless of the situation. Um, life is a roller coaster. Workplace environment is a roller, is a roller coaster. You're not going to always disagree. I mean, agree. There's going to be disappointments, um, and and sometimes when you disagree, that's actually good. That's actually a good thing because if you're working with somebody, you agree all the time. Somebody's not telling the truth. Um, I've been married for ten years, and I can tell you, Laura, tell you, somebody's not telling the truth. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody tell the truth. Um, so that that's how I handle workplace disappointment. It's just um, know your personnel um, and just be at your best, regardless of the you know regardless of the situation, and create an environment where that everybody can be honest and forthright. Um, I think, and I think um, I, I agree with Michael, just to know who you, your personnel is and know where you're at and have realistic expectations and realistic expectations on being a human being. Um, I think it takes a, personally, it takes a lot 
I'm probably this huge optimist. I think everything's going to turn out well. Well, like, okay, well, it got messed up today, but you know, tomorrow is going to get better. So I don't think I ever really take huge disappointments because to me, it, the, the whole process, especially being a teacher, especially seeing, I'm, um, you know, I get to have my children for two years most of the time and seeing them grow. It's such a process that I don't expect anything. Um, I mean, I have expectations for my students. Don't get me wrong; that sounded negative, but I don't. I, I don't think because it didn't happen this one time, it's not going to happen. So it definitely is a roller coaster going up and down. You know, you have your highs and your lows, but everything is progress and everything. Um, can be seen in a positive light and I think um, just ex just knowing that you're dealing with fellow humans you're not dealing with robots you know you're not dealing with perfection because none of us are perfect and, and just having that mindset in the beginning I think with any position or just in life you don't take a disappointment as a roadblock it's just as okay well tomorrow we're just going to work on this issue at hand so um, that's how I deal with disappointment and work. Yeah, Laura pretty much took it out my mind when it comes to optimistic. Uh, I'm a very optimistic person. Um, and a lot of times you're going to work with people who are very pessimistic. You know, I think I, I see the glass is half full and other people just see it completely empty and dry and they might just break the glass. Um, but when it comes to being, work, you know, workplace disappointment, you just got to make sure that when you're going to work, just be focused on what you will really want to achieve. Um, try to achieve your, your goals every day. Try to hit that goal every day. If you don't hit it, well, maybe you can hit it tomorrow and hit another goal. Uh, with that goal uh, intended. Um, workplace disappointment as an adult, it's just gonna happen. I mean, no matter where you work, you could be a professional athlete. You can have workplace disappointment. You could have caught that football, win the game, you dropped it, workplace disappointment. You know, you could be a janitor, you know, you didn't get to you didn't get to clean everything that you wanted to do. No matter what you do in life, there's always gonna be workplace disappointment, but you just gotta learn how to roll with the punches. Um, don't let it get you down. You know, if you, when you start getting down, down that hill, it's going to be a snowball effect and you're just going to keep on going down and down and down. You know, it's always an uphill battle and just let you know that, you know, one day you will get to the top of that hill. And once you get at the top of the hill, you're going to, um, you know, raise your hands in victory. But workplace deployment in general, it's just going to happen no matter what. Um, just got to learn how to deal with it. Like I said, be optimistic, optimistic person as best you can and just uh, try to, you know, thrive on. That's all. And I would say that I'm pretty optimistic as well, but when it came to work, I had to learn um, how to deal with workplace uh, drama or issues because um, it didn't come easy to me. So a lot of the times I would take things home and I'd be upset about it and venting. And it's like, I had to talk to myself, like, what does it matter? Can you change the outcome? Or if not, then don't worry about it. And what can I do in the future to fix that. And I'm not saying it took me, you know, a couple of days and this was a fix or a couple of months. It took me years to realize that don't worry about that thing because there was nothing you can do about it. We just have to move forward. So it was a long process, but I think I've gotten better and I think I handled the situation in the situ uh, whatever situation may arise in a better way. Great, thank you. We have an, another question from the audience. What advice would you give to a high school student? I would say coming out of high school, uh, have a plan. If you plan on going to um, college, make sure that you do uh, achieve your goals and, and go to college. Don't go to college as a party and get away from your parents. Um, go to college and actually do something. Uh, achieve that goal, the reason why you go to college. If you go to a trade school, learn that trade. If you join the military, join the military, but always have a plan. Um, coming out of high school, now it's your responsibility to take care of yourself pretty much. I mean, you probably still live with your parents, but now you have to make decisions on your own. Uh, what are you gonna do with your life? Um, don't follow your friends because your friends, they'll go wherever they wanna go. And you know, you always gonna be following them. Um, be your own person, you know, uh, step in your own footprints. Um, Try to achieve your own goals, you know, don't try to achieve somebody else's goal because they want you to achieve that goal. Whatever you look forward to, go at it and try to achieve that. Um, like I said, out of high school, you start making decisions for yourself. Um, so try to make the best decisions you can. Sometimes you want to make, you know, you want to trip and fall, but just um, always get back up, you know, just never stay down. That's all. Um, sorry, keep talking. Um, I actually, 
kind of have a different, like uh, on the other side of the spectrum um, than Clayton, because definitely um, I, I, what the college I went to was super liberal arts. Um, they, you could make your own majors. There were no requirements. And I was so stuck on following a path that, okay, my first four classes I picked were French, English, math, and um, and then there was like the freshman introductory course because that's what I thought was expected of me. And then I saw there were other people taking just, oh, linguistics and just things they were interested in. So my advice to a high school student is you don't have to have every answer now, but you have, I think you should be open to new educational experiences, new learning experiences, new, new life experiences. But again, learning from them, have that uh, like Clayton said, they'll have the plan to learn from it. Take the architectural class, take or audit the ar architectural class if you had an interest in it. Um, and I think it's really about also knowing who, um, having a support system and finding other people that can help you. Not everyone, um, not everyone can give you the advice you need to hear. Uh, personally, just from my own experiences, you know, I didn't come from, um, my father went to college, but besides that, we didn't, really, there wasn't really anyone else in my family. And there really wasn't anyone else that went to such a liberal arts school around in the community that I did, um, like I did. So I didn't really have anyone to talk to about, hey, what are your interests? How are you going to forge this plan? What do you just want to learn about? And then figure out your career from there, kind of. Um, so I think it's, you know, find people, there are definitely people that want to talk to you and do the, uh, do outreach to other people, or if you have interest in certain areas, find, you know, reach out to alumni in different schools to talk to them how they got there, um, because there are so many different paths, and you don't have to, I don't want anyone to ever feel as if you, since you didn't follow that, okay, I have my major in, uh, I have my English class, my language class, my math class, my science class set. If you're not following that path and that trajectory, it's not wrong. There, it's, there's such an open field out there um, between New Jersey all the way to the West Coast that there are so many, don't, there are so many options. I just would hate for a high school student to limit themselves to the idea of who they think they're going to be in 50 years when if we all look back, you know, I, I couldn't picture myself <laughs> at 17 making the choices I'm making now. So like just being open to new ideas, just understanding different, there are different things to learn and different experiences to expose yourself to and um, not being afraid to reach out to other people that may have um, different experiences and travel down different paths. Uh, I'll take a shot. This is actually something I love um, because if I can go back to the old mic, this is what I would have done um, starting high school, but we didn't know these things. One would be mentorship, um, taking mentorship, um, you know, and this goes into, you know, I guess my first point would have been kick, beg, and scream for everything you want in high school. Uh, you are your biggest advocate, um, not your parents, not your, you know, not your guidance counselor, not your principal. You are your biggest advocate. So kick and beg and scream for what you want. If you want a new course, if you want, uh, if you want certain things, certain activities in your high school that you think that are going to help the environment around you, kick, beg, and scream for everything you want, um, and really take mentorship seriously. I think that's one of the things that we miss from the transition from. Uh, or we missing a transition to higher ed or high school to college. We missed that one transition. Um, goals. I think a lot of people tell you, write down your goals. And, and then you go in your room, piece of paper, you write down 10, 20 goals. To me, that's a misconception. Or I, I, to me, sometimes I feel like that's leading somebody down the wrong path. Write three to five goals. Chip away at it. Um, because then you'll notice after each goal, you're going to write something. You're going to write a spider web off that next goal and then off that next goal. So uh, when you look at your goals, um, look at them in the segments, break them up in quarters. They are four quarters in a year, right? Three months, then three months times the um, <clears throat> times the four gives you 12 quarters in a year. What do you want to get accomplished before the year is done? Um, and the biggest thing is time management. That's the one thing I learned late in college. I'll tell you uh, one, of the thing, one of the things that I like to share with people, my freshman year in college, my first semester, um, this, is, this is chapter seven in the book. Um, I had a 0 0.9 GPA. I uh, had a 0 0.9 GPA, almost got kicked out of college. And I'm like, wow, why? Because I didn't know time management. And so uh, what our coach did for our whole team uh, when he came in, uh, we have six o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock at night. 
but we identified so many gaps that we had in our day that we were wasting time. And so um, manage your time, don't let your time manage you. And, and, and you see that in adults, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Manage your time. Um, that is the biggest advice I can give to somebody and, and take advantage. People are gonna tell you, oh, there's only 24 hours in a day. Um, you create the experience that you want. And so um, that's why it's so important to have good mentors, good leaders in the bag and kick and scream and claw for everything you want because there's nothing but a setup for success in life. So uh, mentorship, time management, write down your goals and don't, don't write goals that you don't understand. Make sure if you write down a goal that you can repeat it back to yourself and articulate to somebody else that can be that mentor to help get you to that goal and, and just be your biggest advocate. Um, I feel like I agree with each one of you. I would take a bit and piece of everything you said and just smash it together. Um, I definitely agree about mentorship. Um, I feel like everyone can benefit from having someone in their life that can guide them in a direction or even just make suggestions and make you think and to let you know that you do have options out there that it's just not okay. You're a young black girl, you can either be a nurse or you can be a teacher because that's what I was always told. I, I, I didn't know that, you know, working at a library would be an option. I didn't know that um, working, my first job was working at Monmouth Medical in medical records and I, I love that job. And I just knew that I loved organizing and having things in order. So if maybe I had a mentor who could have pointed that out sooner, like, oh, you like things in this way. Maybe these are some career choices that would work out for you. Um, also time management, very, very, very important. I agree with Mike, that's a must. And it was the same thing with college. I was working part-time, I was going to college full-time and you just felt like there was never enough time in the day. And you know, one semester I, failed a class and I was devastated and it's just the first time I had ever failed a class ever and then I was like what do I do and I just wanted to quit but I knew that's not the thing that I could do so I you know the next semester I retook the class and got a B plus because I found out that okay no you can't watch television for two hours and think that you're going to read six chapters of medical terminology and be okay to take that test tomorrow. I was like, it just doesn't work that way. You need to spend time and you have to dedicate time for your studies if that's what you, you really want to do. Great. Okay, I'm going to do two more questions. Um, so First one is trying to pick the most important two here. Um, what skills have you found vital to your specific job or position? I'll go first. <laughs> um, for me, definitely organization, having everything organized and in order so that if not me, someone else can uh, be able to find what it is that they need. Like in my office, if I happen to be out, I have all of my story time set up for the entire month. So someone could come in and say, okay, this is the toddler time story. This is the craft that goes along with it. And this is the music music that's gonna go with it. They grab it and then they can go do it. So I found that being organized and having things uh, very neat has been very helpful to me um, and also having a notebook with notes and up my to-do list. I don't have to finish all of my things on my to-do list, but it's very important that I have a list of things that I need to complete so that if I do get sidetracked or someone asks me to help them with something else, I know, okay, these are the things I still need to complete. And um, yeah, that's what I found that has been most useful for me at my job. And time management, which will never go away <laughs> because I might be working on a craft to make this really great spaceship. And if I'm spending three days on that, then I'm neglecting something else. Maybe I haven't done my monthly report or did my statistics that are very important to, um, to my director to know what it is that I'm doing. And if I say, oh yeah, I spent two weeks creating a spaceship, 
how does it look? And you're like, well, you haven't ordered all of the new books. You haven't responded to these emails. You haven't reached out to these organizations to plan programming that they've been doing. So time management, being organized and creating a to-do list of things that need to be done. I'll go next on this. Uh, for my previous job, I was actually working for the government. Um, I was a public safety dispatcher. Um, you guys pretty much know him as a 911 dispatcher or a fire dispatcher. Um, I think there's three skills that I really took to heart as being a dispatcher. Uh, number one was empathy. Uh, number two was multitasking. And number three was attention to detail. Uh, as a public safety dispatcher, a lot of times when people call you, they're hectic. They're screaming. They don't know what's going on. Uh, they need help and they don't know where they're at. So you got to listen to every detail that they tell you. Um, so that's where you come with multitask because you type in and you listen in the background, see if you can hear any kind of noise. Maybe they're by the train tracks, you hear a train come by. You try to, you know, put that information in as well. Um, and empathy, you know, you got to have empathy when it comes to anything, any job that you do, you got to be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoe. Um, if you do customer service, you know, let's say that uh, a customer was uh, calling all day, nobody's answering the phone. So they decide to go to the store and you're the first person they see. Obviously, they're going to come at you at 100% heat, you know, just mad. You just got to put yourself in their shoe, right? You know, you can't, you can't um, argue with them. So if you put yourself in their shoe, you know, what if you was calling the store all day and nobody was answering and then you come in the store, you see the first person, you're probably gonna come at that person the same way. Um, so empathy, I think goes a long way. Um, multitasking, you gotta be able to do more than one thing at a time, um, especially as a dispatcher. And attention to detail, you know, um, make sure your T's across and your I's are dotted. Uh, cause it could be one simple thing, you know, they could say, uh, Potter lane and you put quarter lane, you know, from the, you know, the cops or the fire department going to Potter lane when the emergency is at Porter lane. Um, so attention to detail, uh, uh, all that really blends into one for me. Um, I would say I agree with all that. Organization to me is key. Um, I'm going to say two things that you know, two things that I learned. One, organization is because you know I I write a lot. Uh, you know, function, functionality is doing the day, but you have to understand that you cannot do everything. Um, a term that I learned, um, 2012, um, from the best boss I ever had, um, the 44th president. He said one time, he said, "Organize yourself out of a job." And when I when I heard him say that, I was so confused. I'm like, does that mean he wants? We all got to find jobs after this. No, what he meant was do your job so well and organize yourself so well that so that's where God forbid something ever happens or somebody else can step in your shoes and you have upward mobility that somebody understands the minute they walk in the door and there's not you lose time in the learning curve. Um, time management, the term my college coach used, to, used all the time. And again, this guy couldn't stand it, but he, he changed my life forever was, uh, you know, not to mistake activity for achievement. We, we, we sit behind a laptop or we sit by our phones or we sit by our pen and we do this and we do that. And you're like, did I really do anything? And, 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 and was I intentional about it? So it goes back to your goals. When you, you know, Keisha talked about to-do lists. One of the things that, you know, I found myself successful is at the end of the night, if I always had a to-do list for the next day, you don't make your to-do list the morning of, you make it the night before. So then you understand, I'll get to that other stuff the next day or two days after, but it also is, you know, chart your course of success. Um, you know, you can't, you know, don't put yourself in a way of um, of excuses because things are going to happen. That's life. You know, and hence the term "be at your best" regardless of the situation. So, to me, organ organization, um, time management, and you know, the biggest thing for me is don't mistake activity for achievement. Just because you're doing something um, does not mean you're actually you know, doing anything. Yeah, I agree with. I think everyone's qualities. Um, multitasking, definitely. I think just dealing with. Um, children, you're always multitasking. And um, I think a real skill to have as a teacher, um, I'm lucky enough to also coach high school girls. So you try to um, empower other people and you're really, because we are creating leaders. So it's knowing how to, like uh, Mike said, work yourself out of a, um, work yourself out of a job or, uh, but it's by empowering other people, making other people, um, know that they can succeed, giving them confidence to succeed um, from little children. It's, you know, hey, I used to have a mixed class. I had my four-year-olds teaching 
teaching my three-year-olds and you know helping them with it and that gave them even more confidence to do something it's from having your cat your seniors teach your freshmen and take a, everyone take a freshman under the wing or your juniors take a, a freshman and whatnot um you know having your captains run it and and giving them the confidence giving your confidence into them that you believe in them that they can do it so i think learning how to let go like Mike said, learning um, a skill is to learn how to let go and be confident in those that you have already taught and trust in your teaching or trust in your mentorship and trust in your um, example you have led for others that they can carry it on. Um, but also maintaining interpersonal skills where you can pull someone aside and say, hey, can I have this frank conversation out of respect? So um, empowering others and maintaining um, strong and positive interpersonal skills and multitasking. Definitely. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Last question, because this is a library program, um, I feel like we couldn't get through a panel without a question about books. Um, so what books, podcasts, articles, whatever, are there even still radio shows? Um, should people be listening to, reading, watching? <laughs> Keisha gets me all of my uh, recommendations. Um, I get all my recommendations through Keisha, I'm sorry, for books. Um, I just finished, um, and I'm horrible with names. Um, oh my goodness, the one with the two-spirited person. Anyway, it's a lot of authors. It's a lot of Black African-American, <laughs> a lot of African-American female authors that Keisha recommends. Um, and they've all been wonderful books. So when she suggests something, I am agreeing with her. I would have to say uh, the off author, oh gosh, her name is slipping my mind right now, but she wrote the, it's a trilogy, it's called Binti. It's a science fiction novel and it is absolutely well written. It's beautiful and it's also going to be made into a Disney plus. So excited. Oh, and Children of the, what's it? Children of the Magi, is that the one? Children of Blood and um, Children of Blood and that's. That's a good, uh, I can't wait for book three. That's, that's it for me. Right now, the only books I'm reading right now is Residential uh, Wiring and uh, the NFA, NFPA 70. Uh, the book's about this thick, so uh, I spend most of my time reading electrician books and uh, National Fire Protection Agency uh, copy 70 uh, books of uh, wiring. That's most of my time reading. Very important when you're training to be an electrician. <laughs> I'm pretty boring and basic. Uh, my favorite show, I think I was the only kid in college that watched C-SPAN at nauseum. Um, so my favorite show or that I watch is Morning Joe on MSNBC from six to nine. Um, uh, my favorite podcast that when I listen to podcasts is Pod Save America. Those were brothers that came out of the Obama administration and started a great podcast. And then the book that I, I read, I, I, you know, <laughs> do a ton of reading of just whether it's New York Times, the Atlantic, um, uh, different articles we have to read during the course of the day, um, from our communications department. But I always go back to, especially center on myself. Uh, around this one book, which is The Miseducation of a Negro by Carter G. Woodson. Uh, Carter G. Woodson also is the, quote, you know, for lack of better terms, the founder of Black History Month, uh, which was originally Black History Week. Um, but uh, it, it's so funny because if you read that book, uh, not much has changed now. So it really gives you perspective and lets you know why you cannot stop doing the work that we do. So whether it's in academia, whether it's in um, the trade, whether it's in politics, regardless of what it is, we still have to take hammer to the nail every day. Um, so that's that's the book that is my favorite. And I started reading that book in high school. And if, if it's funny, you read the book, um, you laugh because I'm like, I don't even know what half of these words mean. So my original copy that my sister stole is like pen marks everywhere, highlighters, you know, me getting flashcards because I don't understand words. Um, so yeah, The Miseducation of a Negro by Carter G. Woodson is a great book. Great, thank you. Um, just if anyone in attendance has any last questions for our panelists, now's the time. You can either put a question into chat or the Q and A.
Okay, it looks like no one has questions. So I just wanna thank all of our panelists for such a great discussion tonight and also thank everyone in attendance. And if you have any questions or comments, the library would always love to hear from you. Um, you can reach us at library at gmail.com or at um, the main library, 732-222-3900. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks, you too. Shout out to the new superintendent, Mr. Rodriguez, for coming on. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>